Us, economist Professor Richard Wolf, economist, co-founder of Democracy at Work, author most recently of Capitalism Crisis Deepens, Essays on the Global Economic Meltdown. His website's democracyatwork.info and rdwolf with two Fs dot com. You can tweet him at democracy at WRK. Uh, Professor Wolf, welcome back to the program. Thank you, Tom. Glad to be here. There are a couple of big stories in the news. The uh, the next big fight to save Medicare and Medicaid and Social Security, uh, you know, Robert Reich uh, blogging about this or talking about this. And, well, l let's start there. What would America look like if the social safety net, what, what little there is of it? I mean, there's, there's also the fact that, you know, 60%, 61% of Americans literally don't have $1,000 to deal with an unexpected emergency. Um, what would be the consequence of America losing Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security. If Paul Ryan and Donald Trump and the, the Republican vision, Mike Pence uh, for sure, the Koch brothers, if their vision of America was realized, what would our country be like? Well, it would be what we have now on steroids. It would be a gap between the rich and the poor that would become all the more dramatic because Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid is what stands between millions, let me change that, tens of millions of American households and a level of poverty that we used to see in the documentaries about the third world and that would now descend on us. And by the way, it's not just uh, the immediate sufferers who would be in trouble, uh, the old people who rely on Medicare, the poor people who, re who uh, rely on uh, Medicaid and so on. Because the whole idea of a social security was not just to help the immediate beneficiaries, but their families. Every American family will now be confronted with elderly who are a large and growing part of our population who have to be helped because the social security and the Medicare that they rely on is being cut uh, using the excuse of government deficits caused, of course, by the kind of tax cuts they just passed last month, you get clearly a sense of an American working class being shown in this way that they are in for a long, fundamental decline in their standards of living across the board, old and young, unless they really mobilize politically and say they won't stand for it. You have emboldened, in a sense, we have emboldened, uh, the, the Ryans of the world, the Koch brothers, because they have been able to whittle away benefits, uh, pensions, and all the rest of it for years now, that they can kind of finish us off in a way by cutting these last remaining foundations of the so-called safety net. And I think it bodes very, very badly for, for the whole atmosphere of this country. But here's the, the argument that conservatives make, and Russell Kirk uh, more or less laid this out. I mean, not in the words that I'm using, but the, the essence of it in his 1951 book, The Conservative Mind, which kicked off the modern conservative movement, is that, you know, Victorian England, where you had, which people are familiar with through uh, Charles Dickens' writings, particularly The Christmas Carol, you know, where you had uh, the very, very rich, right, the royal family and their patrons and their friends and whatnot, a very, very small slice of British society. And then you had the middle class, which Scrooge was. He was a, you know, he was a, a businessman. He, ha he had a small business with one employee. Um, uh, the middle class was a very small. It was basically doctors and lawyers. And, and then you had this massive class that was over 90% of, of England's population that was the working poor. And they had maximum wage laws to prevent the working poor from ever becoming middle class. So you couldn't, you, it wasn't that you couldn't pay somebody less than something, you couldn't pay them more than something. And the argument that conservatives make is that that produced one of the most stable economic and political systems in the history of the world. It lasted for hundreds and hundreds of years in Europe. And therefore, we should consider returning to that. What, how, how do you respond? I mean, this, this is what's animating the Republican Party right now. How do you respond to that? Well, I had no idea what the word stability means. You condemned the British people, the mass of the British people, to a level of misery and upset documented in Dickens's other books, Oliver Twist, David Copperfield, uh, you know, The Tale of Two Cities, and all the rest of it. Uh, whatever the stability means, 
it is what the view from the top is, because they don't concern themselves with the absolute turmoil that that kind of a system imposes on the mass of the people. And in England, it particularly produced in the 20th century the upheaval that created the British uh, safety net system, which is a much more generous system even now than what we have here in the United States. They have a basically free higher education, uh, subsidized heavily, much more than the United States. They have the famous National Health Service, which continues because the mass of people want it. Those were upheavals that produced all of that. And it also meant that the British sacrificed, because of their troubles with the mass of people, sacrificed this uh, their dominance. You know, it's an interesting story to say they were socially stable. But at the time Dickens wrote, Britain ruled the waves. Britain was uh, a, an empire on which the, the sun never set. To be unpleasantly blunt and truthful, Britain is now a cold, wet, offshore island of the continent of Europe being shown out the door by the Europeans because they have sunk to such a level and they have a government that is dysfunctional today and, and a welling up of support for the Labour Party. It's not really a, a story of the conservative victory. And it is not a story about stability unless the turmoil caused in the lives of mass of people is ignored by someone, which is, I think, what Mr. Kirk was basically saying. And maybe in America we'll get to that point, too. But it won't be because we're stable. It'll be because we have an, uh, an intelligentsia that looks the other way and justifies the crushing of a middle class. The last point I would make is the British in that period of time weren't coming off of a capitalism that had celebrated itself by saying we created a great middle class. In the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, that's how American capitalism celebrated itself. That was how it was to be thought of relative to the Soviet Union, which provided so many social services by the government. We had a stable middle class. You don't hear it anymore because we've just crushed our middle class, and this taking away the Social Security will take us one step further. But to call that stability is to pretend that when you crush the lives of mass of people, putting them into the kind of turmoil we see reflected in the opioid crisis and a hundred other indices, to call that stability is an act of sugarcoating that is kind of takes your breath away. Yeah, I agree. In the, in the minute we have left, a, a quick question. Back in the Reagan era, the argument was made that when government borrowing expands rapidly and too big, that the government ultimately will not be able to find customers for their bonds, the bond market will collapse, that'll lead to a stock market collapse, that'll lead to an implosion of the economy. There was some speculation in the Financial Times a couple days ago that this might be happening right now because of this one and a half trillion dollars we're going to borrow to fund the, the tax cut for billionaires. Thoughts? Yeah, it's always funny to me that, that the same people who told you before that there could never be a deficit, the deficit is too high, the deficit is going to be a problem, then blithely created a tax cut which you know, makes the deficit go much higher for a short time telling us it doesn't matter. Now that the tax cut is achieved, we're going to go backwards again and suddenly be concerned about a deficit and use that to justify cutting the social safety net. The dishonesty the opportunism wrapped up in that way of thinking makes a mockery of any effort to understand the economic system. Yeah, absolutely. Professor Richard Wolff, economist, co-founder of Democracy at Work, author of Capitalism's Crisis Deepens. Uh, democracyatwork.info is the website and rdwolf with two Fs dot com. Uh, Professor, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you, Tom, and I look forward to speaking with you again. Me too. I always learn from you. Thank you.